slides. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining in. I see uh, there's uh, quite a quite a number of people. That's good. Um, we're here to tell you a little bit about um, our approach at data-driven design in our company, and especially uh, in a project we did in The Hague, uh, a timber high-rise uh, structure. Uh, where we applied this method and did a lot of optimization on uh, and truly integrated design. In, um, and this is what we will try and show you today. But to start uh, off, let's, ah, I already went through the, through the content, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So uh, did driven design, what is it? What do we and, uh, yeah, think it is and how do we apply it in this project? But to start off, a uh, short introduction of who we are. Uh, I think uh, uh, some of the names I see in the in the list uh, already uh, we we know already. And uh, as uh, Claire mentioned, we are all computational design specialists. But uh, for me, uh, I'm actually uh, I started off actually in uh, in bridge design, and there I took up uh, uh, parametric design and and computational design and uh, optimization, especially uh, to integrate as much, uh, as many fields as possible uh, within, uh, within your design. Uh, and next to that, in RHDHV, I will uh, be our, what we now call spe speckle product manager. So uh, I, I don't like to be called a manager, but, <laughs> but I'm, a, I'm a speckle product manager now. Uh, so I will be uh, in the lead of implementing Speckle and helping uh, helping the rest of our colleagues in, uh, in implementing it in their projects. Um, yeah, we do a round, I guess. Huh? So yeah. hi, I'm uh, Peter Schurs. Um, I'm uh, trained as an architect and um, working uh, within RHCHV now as a computational design specialist in uh, in a subgroup that is called the Parametric Lab. Um, it specializes, of course, in, in doing parametric design, um, mainly focusing on uh, on architecture, of course. Um, and uh, within the company, um, I'm in the team that is also uh, supporting the implementation of Speckle uh, within the company and trying to uh, get the, get interoperability uh, to be a common ground for all our engineers and designers. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's my role. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So my name is uh, Jeroen de Bruin. I, uh, I'm also now a computational design specialist. I started at RHCHV as a uh, BIM modeler, then a BIM coordinator, but then also was uh, yeah got involved into parametric design. Uh, and now I work as a uh, yeah speckle uh, BIM product owner internally at uh, RHCHV. So I uh, help developing BIM related tooling on top of speckle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's us. So let's have a look. Uh, yeah, what do we consider now for this uh, yeah, presentation? Data-driven design, because there are uh, various interpretation of this term, and we consider uh, data-driven design as the approach where data is used as a main source for driving design decisions and collaboration among stakeholders, so that we all yeah focus on the data and not necessarily on the documents. So the data is the main source for driving uh, design decisions, and it enables streamlined collaboration among uh, all the various stakeholders. And it goes, uh, as mentioned, hand in hand with the parametric design approach. Uh, it also enables the rapid generation of uh, yeah, various design alternatives. And uh, data-driven design can be a bit scary for some people in the beginning, uh, but it yeah does need to does not need to be complex or complicated. But it's focused about exchanging data instead of documents, and it's uh, about setting up a collaborative design process in a streamlined manner, and it's uh, independent from a specific set of software tools. Uh, so yeah, that's what we consider as uh, data driven design. And yeah, now let's have a look at the, the project. Uh, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Too enthusiastic. Yeah, so uh, traditional way of working, then uh, people exchange documents. So everyone has their own set of tools. They create an output from that, a certain document. 
they send it via email or share it via uh, some web server, and they uh, and someone else is processing the document. But we're not after the document, but we are after the data that is inside the document. The data is interesting for yeah the users for us. Uh, so we are looking at a data-driven design process where we have interoperable tools and a data-centric process. And uh, yeah, a few years ago at RCHV, we were also looking into how can we facilitate this process, this data-driven way of work. We tried uh, various things internally. We also sought uh, after external tools, uh, but then eventually yeah, I came across Speckle and uh, yeah, it proved really valuable as we're going to show now uh, for the project in which we use it for yeah mona four so and peter the yeah peter, to you. thanks Simon. yeah i think uh, in, indeed speckle is a key differentiator for us uh, as a technology to make this data-driven approach uh, happen uh, and monarch uh, the monarch project is a prime example uh, within our company of this uh, data-driven approach so that's why we're um, going to discuss this project uh, for you guys uh, today, um, the 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 Mona project was uh, was a commission by a uh, Rijksvastgoedbedrijf, which is the the real estate department of the Dutch uh, uh, government, actually, um, and they had a tender uh, written out for the development of a high-rise building in the city center of uh, of The Hague, um, and they were looking for multidisciplinary design support on that. Um, to the next slide uh, so it's really on a central location uh, in a very dense uh, area in the in the city center of the hague where there are already multiple high rises and it was actually quite a difficult plot to uh, to fill in so um the rijksvastgoedbedrijf was really looking for an integrated uh, uh, engineering company to support them on getting a grip on that uh, complex location um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, you see how we uh, eventually filled in that plot. So you can see that it's actually a high-rise volume that is clamped in between two other high-rise volumes. So you can imagine there is issues with uh, daylight, there is issues with shadow, uh, but there's also issues with wind. Um, and of course, we needed to solve all the structural and architectural problems that come with such, such a commission. So there were uh, a lot of issues to deal with in this case. Um, and what uh, struck us in the uh, in the uh, initial commission or in the uh, original ask, which is on the next slide, um, was that they actually requested for a parametric design approach. Um, this was actually a, a first, I think, uh, in in in, in, what, in this type of commissions that we saw this actually in the initial ask from the from the company. Um, and we, of course, were immediately triggered by this. Um, this would be a very uh, well, uh, a very good commission for us as a company to uh, to work on. So, of course, we were very enthusiastic to to start on that and to to submit a proposal. Um, and because of our experience with that, we were also able to um, to really add value to the project. And and uh, and and this is one of the main reasons we also got selected as a company to uh, to work on this project. You go to the next slide. Um, what we uh, did also in the organization of the project is that we uh, facilitated a very agile collaboration and direct collaboration with the Rijksvastgoedbedrijf, who took care of the architectural services internally in this case. And we were really functioning as a support consultant with all the multi uh, with all the various disciplines directly connected um, uh, together um, to. to start optimizing the design. And what we did actually was to have uh, recurring online workshops where we, in each workshop, would really sit together and would look for uh, intense design collaboration, real-time collaboration with the client, with our parametric models, to really look for an optimized design result. Um, we will now, in the presentation, run through the main topics of, uh, of some of these uh, workshops that we held. Uh, and we're gonna start with uh, workshop number two. <laughs> uh, which was actually the sort of the initial uh, integration of the model and the setup of the model, um, which is also on the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah. So the core of our um, of our uh, tooling uh, of our approach was uh, built in a 
parametric co coordination model. That's how we adopt it, uh, or how we tend to adopt it in, in, uh, internally. We set up a parametric model that contains the main uh, um, dependencies, and the main relationships, the main, uh, uh, I'm looking for the word, raakvlakken, uh, between interfaces. interfaces between the disciplines. Yes, thank you. Um, and of course, this is a model that is flexible that we can adjust easily, so we can change uh, the height, we can change the footprint, we can change the number of floors, um, and we can change the main layout on that. Um, and this model served as a base to generate our initial uh, geometrical data set uh, that we sent uh, to the Speckle platform. And um, this is then this data set, these streams are then the starting point for all the other disciplines to, uh, to continue from. Go to the next slide. Um, oh yeah, I was uh, a bit ahead with, <laughs> with my talking to the, to the slides, I see. So yeah, Speckle really is the core technology that we actually use to tie all these different elements together. Um, this is, of course, a, a diagram you might be already familiar with, I can imagine. Um, and of course, in this specific project, we have our own project-specific adaptation of that. So yes, on the next slide, I guess. So centrally, we have our coordination model running in Grasshopper, which we can easily adjust which we, to uh, generate different scenarios. And using Speckle, we connect this to several different aspect models for the individual engineering disciplines. Um, for example, a, a structural analysis model, which you see on the, the right bottom, more or less, uh, but also a daylight analysis model, uh, a sunlight and shadow analysis model, uh, and also a site model. Um, and we use Speckle as the, as the connecting technology between those. You go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so an important topic uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the design of the Monarch was actually the, uh, the, the balance between the structural elements, uh, the openings in the facade, uh, and the daylight accessibility uh, um, into the building. Uh, and this is what we try to uh, um, optimize during uh, several of our workshops. Go to the next uh, slide. And in this specific workshop, we really investigated um, the, um, <clears throat> the detailed uh, daylight analysis initially to see what would happen if we would change the main grid of the building and how that would influence uh, the, uh, the daylight factor on different floor levels within the building, which is shown on the next building, the next uh, slide. Um, so we actually were able to change our coordination model, send that geometric information through Speckle, and then run a real-time daylight analysis uh, on the different sizes of the facade openings. As you can see, we were playing around with um, the grid layout on the facade, which is also the structural grid, and to see how the different sizes and opening would influence the daylight access uh, to the different floors um, in order to, uh, to find out what that relation would be and how we would need to optimize these different uh, elements uh, to come to an overall best design solution. We'll go into more detail, I think, on the next step on that. Yeah, so what we've seen is uh, we see the diagrid structure that we have on the facade, and we've seen that it already has a, a kind of a gradient in the density in the building. When you're going up, you get uh, less dense uh, density of the diagrid because you need less uh, dense cross sections to, to bear the load because there's less load on top of the building. Uh, and we see the effect that has on the uh, on the daylight analysis. However, um, we did this mainly in a first design choice as option that you have a certain gradient uh, over this uh, over the over the uh, the levels in the in the building we have. Um, but if we um, look at the individual elements themselves in the diagrid, we actually have a lot of extra room for optimization. If we go to the next slide, we see that we actually are able 
um, to optimize the materials and, and reduce the material usage uh, to uh, by about 30% from 2,800 uh, cubes of timber, we can go to uh, 2,000. And this was um, uh, mainly uh, because instead of looking at an entire floor, we could now um, analyze individual elements in the entire structure. We could have a look at the horizontal beams be uh, behind the um, behind the grid itself and the actual grid in the uh, in the facade. Um, if we look to the next slide, we see that we we built a Karama model to do this. Um, Karama, for those of you who don't know it yet, is a, a FEM package uh, for Grasshopper, um, made by Clement Spijsinger. It's a very nice tool and it has a, a great, great optimization options in it. Um, works quite fast, especially with 2D FEM models, or sorry, 1D FEM models. Um, and you can see that, that we can then optimize this uh, based on this uh, FEM analysis, and then we send the outcome back to our coordination model to then again explore what this means for the rest of the disciplines that we have integrated into our design. Um, and if we then look at the next slide, we see, uh, if you look closely, you'll see the density of the grid actually changing. And this is through different design stages and different uh, optimization steps uh, through the yeah through the process, which of course then led us to a uh, great material reduction. So that was a great outcome. But it also left us with a lot of different design options. So we have a baseline design, and I see we <laughs> have it half in English and half in Dutch. We call that Dinglish in. <laughs> Which we're really good at, right? Yeah, so that's very good. Yeah. So we have our baseline design, then, then we determine the, the required data grid profiles by our standard measurements. But then we also have a maximum percentage of, um, of, of glass on our levels. Um, and we need to specify what these uh, maximum amounts are for each orientation of the building. And uh, so we can actually um, uh, the word for validate. So we can test. actually validate if, and test if the, uh, the amount of radiation we get in our levels uh, is still uh, conform the um, thermic uh, comfort in the, in the building and the energy demand and, uh, and actual daylight uh, entrance of, their, of the building. So this, um, again, we recorded a lot of the uh, options uh, uh, we came by and then left us with uh, all these kinds of images and a lot of extra data that, uh, that is connected to these images because we have uh, all kinds of different densities on different levels and different uh, options we, we have to validate. And if we go uh, to the next slide, we see that we make, um, according the uh, parametric options we have for the for the structure, uh, we also have the uh, the physics model accordingly. Uh, with oh, you see 144 options analyzed uh, for. Architecture, structure, energy, daylight, and thermal uh, comfort. All these disciplines are taken into account, and then um, uh, we can actually analyze them, and we can um, make a design exploration using Design Explorer by Thorne Tomasetti. Uh, we actually use that quite a lot now for uh, for using uh, optioneering, as we call it. So. In the next slide, we see that we have uh, set all these options next to each other, and we can actually analyze how many, uh, what the energy levels are in the building 
uh, what the total cooling load is, the maximum heating load, and uh, with what kind of parameters, uh, input parameters, we uh, get to this. So we can actually use this to find our optimal solution. Because letting the computer decide what, what an optimal solution is, is always very difficult. And then after the engineering design and engineering part on this side, um, we had to work towards uh, actual BIM model, since that's still uh, usually one of the newer models. Uh, yeah, yeah, indeed. So, uh, uh, yeah, we need to deliver a Revit model. And uh, the main advantages for uh, looking into Revit uh, using Speckle, that we could generate, let's say, roughly 80% of this Revit model deliverable. And it's much faster than manual modeling, especially with all the uh, diagonals and uh, various uh, profile types. And uh, also the biggest advantage is that it's aligned with all the other disciplines because yeah, we all use the same uh, parametric coordination model. Yeah. So yeah, this workflow, uh, if we look into a bit more detail, yeah, we have the grasshopper uh, coordination model that we send to uh, the data stream with speckle objects in it. We can send that to the speckle server and then we can receive that in Revit. And uh, for, yeah, for this project, as uh, some of you might recognize, we used the speckle version one for this. Uh, that yeah, worked really well. And I also uh, have a video about it to yeah, show how it actually looked like like this. So here you see the parametric model. We created various data streams for it. Uh, various elements and in the speckle version one viewer you could view it and all your data was accessible in a JSON format. So the data is online openly available for anyone. And then the nice thing is in Revit you can then receive these data streams. And also not only geometry, but as you can see, you can also generate uh, the levels. So this is then also all aligned with the uh, parametric coordination model. And also the geometry, cut it up in uh, various streams. And the nice thing is it's all native uh, Revit geometry, because previously we were also looking into other solutions, but they were just uh, uneditable objects which aren't uh, yeah, really useful but now they are proper BIM objects. So this yeah worked really well it saved uh, a lot of time and you know it's aligned with the uh, yeah with the parameter. I think the key advantage is that we can actually spend more time on optimizing and optioneering our design uh, rather than actually having to spend a lot of time on modeling or remodeling uh, uh, from the yeah, based on the design model, so we can actually have that immediate workflow from any model we set up to get to our deliverables. I yes, yeah, key of in this one. We have a lot less effort in the actual production, uh, making hours to to setting up drawings and setting up uh, setting up the, the details of the model. We can actually focus on the on the overall design. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, indeed, and also yeah, when you have the Revit. It's rather easy to like, make uh, nice renders. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah, so as we just saw, Speckle is awesome. It works really well. Uh, but yeah, one thing, some feedback we got from our Revit modelers uh, that uh, you still manually need to load the Revit families and the types. And in Grasshopper, the parametric designer, uh, needs to define the Revit family name. So it needs to be really, really aware of all the BIM concerns. So we at RGB we built a Revit add-in, a family build, and that basically, uh, based on the data and the stream, it loads the required Revit family and it and type, and then it fills in the Revit family name in the speckle object. So this also saves the Revit modeler even more time. Uh, and it looks like this. Uh, so you get an overview. Of, 
pause it for a sec, then I can explain it. Uh, so this was an initial version of the add-in. So you have two categories, beams and columns. And on the left, you see the speckle type that was assigned to that beam. And on the right, you see the uh, map type. So you build a, a mapping table in this plugin and then, uh, yeah, this plugin then knows if it's a beam with a speckle type uh, SHS 140.5, it needs to know which Revit family uh, yeah, matches with that and adds it to the project and also adds this Revit family data to the speckle stream. Uh, so then you can, yeah, the Revit modeler can also double check it and make tweaks if something isn't, uh, isn't right. Yeah, the same for the columns. And then just submit it. It uh, creates a new stream, and then with the native Speckle Revit uh, plugin, you can generate the Revit instances in your model. Uh, so that yeah, even saved more time for the Revit models and also for new projects. Yeah, this is a good example, I think, of the of the type of developments that we that we do to facilitate our own workflows on top or around Speckle. Uh, this was this was very BIM focused, so that was uh, Jeroen's uh, uh, role really as a as a PO. Um, and we're also venturing into uh, more web based developments. Uh, I think there's also a um, a lecture coming up tomorrow. I think, right? Of an example uh, from one of our uh, Thursday, I think Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, correct, correct, Thursday. Yeah, yeah. So we really uh, built on uh, on Speckle uh, to facilitate uh, that uh, automatic design process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah indeed. So uh, yeah, as uh, yeah, as we've shown um, before, we did some research towards a suitable interoperability platform, and Speckle One point uh, definitely proved its value. In, in our workflows, in, uh, also the tools we are developing, how well that connects. So currently we are working on a transition to uh, Speckle 2.0, uh, setting up the servers, uh, modifying our tools to yeah, also the BIM add-in or the Revit add-in I just showed you. We are working to uh, transition that to Speckle 2.0 as well. And in the future, yeah, just building on top of uh, Speckle 2.0 and continue on that. Of course, all the amazing work is that that is done by the Speckle team. So many cool developments and new features are coming up. And uh, yeah, I get really enthusiastic if I look on the blog or on the forum and see it's coming. So uh, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so yeah, and I want to say thank you all for your time and attention. And remember, we don't want to be document driven, but we do want to work data driven. <laughs> So thank yeah. you all. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was the end of it of our session. If there are any uh, questions, uh, feel free yeah, <laughs> to stop sharing uh, my screen. Yes. Time for Q and A. Finish a loop. Always good. I see we have uh, some some questions in the Q and A. Um, I don't know how uh, Dimitri and Matteo highlighted those in their uh, speech, but. There's a question, did, did the timber supplier take over your speckle stream for downstream fabrication? Well, so in this case, uh, no, <laughs> because that, that was not the level of development that we went into uh, in this project. So this was a, uh, a preliminary uh, design uh, development, um, which I think was taken to building permit, but no further uh, farther than that. So it's, it's still uh, pending in a way. Uh, but we're, we didn't go into uh, all the way into manufacturing, which would be, of course, very nice and I think very possible. Um, as a company, we do have experience with those kind of things, uh, but but uh, but in this case, not. Yeah, I also see a question uh, from Daniel about the mapping tool. Uh, if this is part of Speckle, uh, I will have already answered most of it in the in the chat, but. As of now, it, it's not part of Speckle. It's something we developed because it's also mainly uh, based. So the mapping is actually based on our standard naming in the, in the in our company libraries. Yes. Um, but I think the, the technology behind it would be uh, very shareable. Would be very shareable. So um, if there's interest in that, then 
but I don't, don't think anyone can use it as is for now. No, but the, the the actual idea behind it would be. Uh, I think I think there's maybe a more common uh, a more common issue, right? To actually make sure that. Uh, the data you send through Speckle actually fits with your own templates and standards and uh, and your BIM uh, protocols. Um, so this is a helpful uh, element in that. And I can imagine this is something. Uh, yeah, we built a tool. The JSON was first, uh, or the mapping table was first baked into the plugin. But now indeed, it's yeah also more flexible that it's that even the user can edit it themselves. Um, yeah. It's definitely a good addition and makes the whole workflow a lot easier and faster. Yeah, yeah I just now have access to the chat because I was sharing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, any other? Yeah, there's also another question, uh, which might be a question for you, Jeroen. Um, I see the geometry is passed to Revit at an approximate level of LOD 100. How do you deal with parts that are more complex than simple uncut beams? Uh, yeah, good question. Also at uh, RGV, some other colleagues of mine have uh, developed a uh, Revit toolbar that really focuses on uh, modifying Revit geometry. Like, uh, for example, one simple thing would be disallow join. If you need we to use do that, that a lot. <laughs> if you need to do that all manually, then yeah, uh, grab some tissues because tears will be flowing. Uh, for sure, <laughs> <laughs> but with this tool, yeah, you can just select all the elements and uh, apply disallow join to yeah your selection. So we have like uh, uh, when you have the generated geometry, then we have some tools to uh, post process it. Let's say uh, also to improve the level of detail and. Uh, yeah, make that better. Um, but also data-wise, that's also really nice regarding Speckle that you can add uh, all your data to your parametric model. And then uh, the BIM element you are generating already contains a lot of that data. So we also are looking uh, more into that now. That the objects that you generate already contain a lot of data which you collate in your parametric model. Yeah. of various sources so that you don't need to do all uh, all of your data management within Revit, but do that in your parametric model. Yeah. Bit of an elaborate answer, but hopefully it uh, answers your question. If not, please check. Yeah. I see another question from uh, T. Tina. On, uh, can we say this will invalidate Revit modelers? Um, well, I don't. I don't think we can state that. Not at all. Um, I don't. I do think. I do think that working this way will change roles, and it will change also the role of the modelers, and it will, but it will also change the role of the architects. So it, it's a complete reshuffle on how we all collaborate in a in a large firm like this with all these different roles and disciplines, um, and it will. I think increase the focus on design content rather than uh, than. Uh, workflows getting to deliverables. It will it will make making that deliverable much easier and less tedious. Uh, and, and hopefully we, we mainly automate the tedious and boring work, and we actually uh, start focusing on making better designs and, and, and creating better content. In that sense. Yeah, I think that's a really important part. So the focus lies on the different different time in a different time frame in the in the process and and also in the yeah a different part of the process so uh, as i mentioned before not not on the actual uh, production and uh, the production hours that the uh, you know what might be a bit of brain dead uh, clicking and, and actually focus on the creativity and um, yeah getting most out of your designs yeah and uh, if i can add as well that uh, yeah, I think we are constantly learning and developing. Roles are changing, uh, new tools are emerging. So, uh, yeah, I would also highly recommend Revit modelers to look into this if you are interested. And don't let uh, new technology surpass you and yeah, be left behind. If people who still uh, would like to work on uh, drawing 
by hand on a big table like uh, 30 years ago. Yeah, that's uh, uh, yeah not working now anymore. So yeah, we all just need to. I think we all just need to learn and uh, keep embracing these new tools and technologies and make the whole AUC industry better uh, using them. Yeah. I think we ran through the questions mostly. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think then in that case, that's it for us. Yeah. Unless there are any more questions or any anything uh, people would like to add. Been a bit short, but uh, we highlighted everything. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank uh, you for joining. If you still have any questions afterwards, you can always, of course, contact us. Yeah. And uh, maybe we'll see you in some other sessions. Yeah. All right. And yeah. uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. They're yeah, great speakers. So uh, don't miss out. I'm looking forward to some of them as well. Yeah. Most yeah. of them. Great. Right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.